Hey guys, welcome back to Feast in the Middle East. Just to mix things up, I'm about to share with you my latest appearance on the popular radio talk show called Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. Now to join Jamal's more than quarter of a million followers on Facebook, just look up his name Jamal Dejani for news from the Middle East you won't find anywhere else. Uh, let's go to the fun part just now uh, and talk about cooking, which uh, just <laughs> kind of like to divert our... I need it. <laughs> take I need a it, break Jamal. from this heavy political stuff. I need and it. So and, we... Blanche, and Blanche is a, gr- is a great, great person to do this, Jamal. She's yeah, really so wonderful. Let's listen uh, to this interview with her, giving us tips how to cook simple, delicious meals at home during quarantine. Joining us from her kitchen in Northern California, Blanche Shaheen, cookbook author and host of Feast uh, in the Middle East, a cooking show where she shares heirloom recipes that her Palestinian family has passed down to her through generations. Welcome again to Arab Talk, Blanche. Thank you, thank you. I just wish you that w- I was there in the studio with you so I could share these goodies with you. Well, this is not our studio. This is the yeah. makeshift studio from our shelter in place because we actually can't go there. So <laughs> uh, so, so for those who don't know, Blanche uh, has been on our show several times sharing healthy recipes uh, with our audience. Let me tell you something, Blanche, how happy it makes me uh, to host you again on the show. Not that because you are an old colleague and, and, and a friend, but you speak my language, food and <laughs> politics. Yes. So, so, this is a, so this is a deadly Palestinian concoction we inherited from our elders, right? We're just sitting around the table and talking about politics and talking about food. But we want to focus more on the fun stuff the food today. Talk quickly just about the book, uh, and we talked about it before, but for our uh, new listeners and viewers uh, to the show, uh, this was a big journey for you. That was was. like, so what inspired you to really uh, go ahead with it? Because it's also a costly, uh, you know, thing to go through. It was, it was. Um, Really, uh, in the beginning, it's actually what I set out to do in the beginning for my own family, for my own kids. Um, I wanted to record all of the recipes because it's part of my cultural identity as a Palestinian. I felt it was important to preserve these recipes and pass them on to my children. And then when I made the YouTube videos, uh, there was like this whole community of people that seemed to appreciate the cuisine and want to get involved and want to make the food. And, and it extended to, you know, Americans who love going to Middle Eastern restaurants or people that had married somebody Middle Eastern and wanted to impress the family they married into or a college kid that like is, is you know far away from their family and miss, misses mama's cooking and wants to create it uh, in his apartment far away. Uh, so I realized that I was sort of a, uh, a support for all of these people all over. I mean, when you look at like the Palestinian diaspora or Lebanese or Syrians, there's so many of us that have been displaced. And the one thing that unifies all of us is food. And so I felt like I could be this bridge of culture for everybody to come together. And they send me their dishes and I like resharing them on social media because mm-hmm. I'm proud of them and what they've accomplished. And so this book, I, it took me 10 years to you know, to write. It took me crazy amounts of capital to publish it on my own, but nothing was going to stop me. I'm like, I'm going to have a book, a legacy that I can keep, not just for my immediate family, but now for my global cooking family, which has been created ever since I created uh, my show on the YouTube platform. Uh, So that has been really special. A lot of them demanded it. Like I tried to postpone it. The more I postpone it, they're like, come on, when's your cookbook coming out? So they held me accountable in a way. You know, what's great is in tandem with the book, a lot of the recipes, uh, almost all of them are on my channel because some people want extra technical assistance. They can just get it right off of my channel and it, and it helps them tremendously. You no, know, everyone is facing the, in, during these difficult times, the sheltering in place and more and more, more and more people like myself and others who relied on going out, eating out in restaurants, whatever, they're finding themselves having to eat at home and prepare meals. So some, of course, have the skills, others like myself don't. (laughs) So for for the novices who love basically Middle Eastern cuisine, 
And, and then we want to talk to you about some of your recommendations and, and recipes. I mean, you brought up a good point about quarantine uh, because it, it is quite sad. A lot of people found themselves with restaurants closed and food shortages and unable to cook and wondering, how am I going to survive? What am I going to live off of? You know, and grabbing everything from the frozen section, heating it up and hoping that they'll survive through this mess. And so what I did at the time was I did this, uh, I called it quarantine cheap eats, like how to eat on a budget using uh, grains that are very popular in the Arab world. So grains like bulgur wheat and frika uh, and maftul, maftul is like a couscous. So what people could do is get these grains as the foundation and then take it from there, add on some vegetables, add your protein, uh, add some chickpeas, add some raisins or pistachios, put dressing on it. And so that's, that's what I really want to do is acquaint them with pantry staples that don't go bad in an emergency that they could whip up and put together and feed a family for under $10, basically. And then of course the grains kind of last for a long time, so you don't have to worry about them. Yeah. Yes, you and know. lentils too, lentils and chickpeas. Like for example, these falafel, right? Take a look at the, these falafel right here. Look at the inside. These are made of chickpeas with just a few herbs and they have a meaty taste and texture and they're quite filling. But a bag of dried chickpeas is like $2, right? And they keep in your pantry for, for a year or more, many years. And you can turn something, this is what Adam do, man. We, we take chickpeas and we turn it into this, okay? I made batches of these and I froze it. So whenever the family wanted some, you just take some out and fry it. Uh, so that's why it, uh, Arabs really know, like I, I realized after this whole quarantine that my parents were always prepared for lockdown, but never even knew it in the mm -hmm. sort of cuisine that they taught me how to make. Do you know what I mean? Like they had this stuff frozen. They're known, Arabs are known for having two, three refrigerators packed to the hilt with food so that they'll have you it. Because never, you never know when your cousin's gonna show up and announce, right? Right, They yeah. just ring your doorbell and then you have a party of 12. <laughs> I know, and then somehow these women whip up a meal for 12 people in like under two hours, you know? It's incredible. And also things like, okay, one thing that I thought about was ground meats, right? Ground meats are always cheaper than regular steaks, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's ground turkey, whether it's ground beef. Uh, and then there was a ton of Beyond Meat. I can't stand the stuff, but a lot of people like it. And what you could do is you could turn it into, okay, these are called arayas. And these are crispy sandwiches where we take, arayas means bride and groom. I mm -hmm. guess like the bride is the white bread and the groom is the, the dark groom tuxedo, the meat in the middle. <laughs> They're in, a, in an embrace, in a sandwich embrace, okay? The meat is very, very thin, you know? So a little bit goes a long way. You stretch it out with lots of pita bread so it's filling for less money. And we brush it with olive oil and boil it in the oven so it's nice and crispy when you eat it like a cracker. And then it has the meat, you could dip it in hummus. And it, and you know, like you could get a packet of ground, whatever kind of meat you want and feed in an entire family with it. And everybody would get full simply because, you know, you've got it, you've got it in the, in these pita, pita sandwiches. And that's another resourceful way to make like a meat extend to feed a family. Uh, here's another uh, specialty called Ijja. Have you heard of Ijja? Can you tilt that, tilt, tilt the dish a little bit? Here we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I say, yeah. It's just basically a zucchini pancake, right? So zucchinis are in oh. season right now. And uh, there's copious amounts of zucchini in the farmer's markets. And uh, there, it's, there's so many different varieties. And one way my kids love to eat zucchini is in a pancake. So when you mix it up with a little bit of flour, uh, eggs, and some herbs, this is where you can have fun with it, like... I put chopped parsley and mint, but wow. you can add basil, you can add uh, uh, tarragon, anything you want. And a little bit of Parmesan cheese to give it some zest and eggs. And then you flip it over. And then what my kids like to do, so you'll take something like this and you can customize it, right? So I mm. like mine with hummus, which is kind of weird, hummus. But if you want to make it Italian, you could put marinara and put mozzarella and broil it in the oven. If you want it Mexican style, you could put a little bit of sour cream and salsa. 
Uh, you could add some avocado and smoked salmon. I mean, it's really a great foundation that you can take in all sorts of fusion directions. There's the texture. Yeah. I put some Parmesan in there. You could see some of the herbs peeking through the zucchini. I wish you were here. I feel bad. I'm like, look at all this food. You can't <laughs> You're torturing me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at it. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Blanche, I want to thank you for coming on Arab Talk and uh, stay safe. You know, with this is what we keep, you know, and hopefully uh, we can talk uh, again. Uh, very soon. I so hope so. Um, anytime when we, we can maybe have you in the studio when this whole crisis uh, ends, hopefully soon. Inshallah, as we say. I sure hope so. And I'll bring goodies like always. Okay? <laughs> Deal. Thank you for your time. Always great to see you.